Mr. Les Brown in the house. How people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. In order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. It's opposite of that. Never let what you want to say get in the way of what your audience needs to hear. So you're always pushing yourself. You're always challenging yourself in pursuit of that person that you know that's in you, the next greatest version of yourself, but you haven't quite got there yet. How is it that I can become so impactful that a guy will say, you know what? I know he's black, but I don't give a damn about his paint job. He can, he can help us make some money. <laughs>
So ask strategic questions before you show up hmm. so that you know more about them than they expect you to know and that you can create an experience strategically with your story and other stories because how people live their lives is a result of the story they believe about themselves. So when you speak, what we do is distract, dispute, and inspire. We distract them from their story, their self-explanatory style. We dismantle their current belief system based upon what we have experienced and how we relate that to them and what they're dealing with and ignite a spirit of courage to begin to make a new decision about their lives. And as you are aware, we make decisions and our decisions make us. Uh, I find this uh, pretty brilliant for you to bring all this stuff up because uh, for many people that uh, need to be refreshed about uh, Les Brown's story, you, you, were, you were deemed somebody that uh, was dyslexic or mentally uh, handicapped. I was labeled educable, mentally e retarded. Educable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. that they, he can't learn. <laughs> He, they call me DT, the dumb twin, because I have a twin brother. Yeah, and so, and that stayed with me. And when I met Mr. Washington, who this gentleman, he, he taught me three main things that, that to this day serves me well. I was in his class waiting on a friend of mine named MacArthur Stevens. Gotcha. And, and he said, I want you to go to board and work this problem out for me, young man. Mm -hmm. And I said, sir, I'm not one of your students. He <laughs> said, go and do what I'm asking you to do anyhow. I said, I can't do what you're asking me to do. And the other students started laughing, saying, he's Leslie. He's got a twin brother, Wesley. Wesley is smart. He's DT. And he asked, what's DT? And they said, he's the dumb twin. And they erupted in laughter. And I said, I am, sir. And he came from behind his desk. He looked at me. Right. He said, don't you ever say that again. Hmm. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Do you hear me? And I, I said, yes, sir. He disrupted the, the vision that I had of myself and how I saw myself. And, and I wanted to be like him. I followed him. He, he was a, a guy that I loved how he dressed, always in shirt and tie. And I loved how eloquent that he was. And I've never known my birth mother or father until just a few months ago. Wow. Yeah. And so as a result, yeah. I followed him and wanted to be like him. And Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, because they were great orators, and Billy Graham. I always studied people who had great presentation skills. That has always been a fascination of mine. What did you take away from your early studies of these speakers? And I'm going to get back to the strategic questions here in a second, but... What did you take away from the people that uh, inspired you? What caught your attention? What caught me is, is that one, you can transform people's lives and you don't know them. Complete strangers, based upon how you put your presentation together and them seeing you in a, in a light that they feel comfortable letting you into their minds and you can take them to a place in themselves that they can't go by themselves because you, you can't read the label if you're locked in the box. And so I spent time to study the mind. How is it that I'm meeting these people for the first time? And what is it that I can do to create an experience that will transform them, three-dimensional storytelling, that we can expand their vision of themselves beyond their mental conditioning and their culture and, and, and the environment that they're in and touch their hearts because we're emotional people and ignite their spirit where they have the courage to say, I'm going to do something different with my life. That's, that's to me is the most important things that we can do because people are asking when they hear you speak one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, or large groups, who are you? What do you have? And why should I care? And so in the course of the presentation, when you address those things so that people feel comfortable, they mm -hmm. trust you, they're willing to be transparent and allow you to come into their lives and speak to them and, and help them to begin 
to learn techniques and strategies on how to make the rest of their lives the best of their lives. Take them on that journey, that experience. Oliver Wendell Holmes said that once a man or woman's mind has been expanded with an idea, concept, or experience, it can never be satisfied to going back to where it was. When you think about the audience that you're talking to, to really understand them, what are those, uh, if you have, if you were to boil it down to maybe three, four, maybe five questions that you ask to really get to know that audience so you can deliver that, what's some of the questions you should ask from every audience before you speak to them? When you look at yourself, look at the industry, look at where you're going and the goals that you want to achieve, and hopefully they're far beyond what you achieved last year, what radical change must you make in your culture, in your mindset, individually and collectively, and how you're showing up in your industry? Because people don't live life as it is. They live life as they are. So in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. <laughs> so what changes are you going to make that will allow you to begin to achieve these goals that you've set for yourself. They, you're in this place where Einstein said that the thinking that has brought me this far mm -hmm. has created some problems that this thinking can't solve. And so now it's about going within. Now it's about self-awareness. Who are you really now? How did you get here? And what will it take for you to get from here to over here? This requires that another level a new set of skills that you don't have right now. So what is it you need to do so that you can upgrade yourself? You know, we have yeah. the computer, we have to do updates. Okay, sure. To yeah. update yourself. Robert Shula said, we either expand or we are expendable. <laughs> You've been speaking now, what, 50? 52 years. Whew, 52 years speaking. What were some of the early um, circumstances you had to maneuver early in your career to get you to start building a platform for yourself so people can start picking you out and hearing about you? Well, when I first saw a, a infomercial with Robert, with, with Tony Robbins, I said, I got a story too. You know, he had this infomercial called Personal Power and in Gunthe Rinker and those guys, they spent millions of dollars promoting him around the world that every hour you would see a Tony Robbins wow. infomercial. So I sent them, one of my uh, DVDs, and they responded saying, you got an inspiring story, but you're black. Dang. And we don't believe that America's ready for a black Wow, they straight up said like that. Straight up. And so I sent them a letter back saying, thank you very much for reminding me that I'm black. <laughs> I never would have known that if you hadn't told me. <laughs> I said, I'll see you from the top. <laughs> uh, and so I, I, I decided that we were going to go forward even though we did not have millions of dollars from an investor to, to get national and global attention. That part of what we do in training speakers, the goal is to make what you do in terms of your presentation so powerful, so impactful that you cannot be ignored, that people would want to hear more of what it is that you share. And, and the word will go out that, mm -hmm. hey, I heard this guy or I heard this young lady mm -hmm. and they really impacted my life. And so wow. I just said, I'm coming in this space and my goal is not to be a player. My goal is to be a dominant player up in here. Take no prisoners <laughs> and eat the wounded. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm hearing prejudice and racial bias. I'm hearing expo exposure because there wasn't a budget to get you out there. Um, so those are the things you had to maneuver and change. What would you say also is some of the things that haven't changed is some universal truths to getting your message out there, to leading a movement? What things haven't changed? I just, the prejudice. It hasn't changed, <laughs> no, still. No, absolutely not. Okay. Well, this, that's, well, first of all, that's gonna always be with okay. us. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What's most important is not focusing on the things 
that are designed to hold you back and destroy your sense of self. Here you go. What's most important is your focus on you. How are you going to deal with this? What am I going to do with this? That's what I'm always asking myself. This requires a new set of skills. How is it that I can become so impactful that a guy will say, you know what? I know he's black, but I don't give a damn about his paint job. He can, <laughs> he can help us make some money. <laughs> so, so to me, life, you know, it's not fair that birds eat worms, but they do. Yeah. And yeah. so life is not fair. And it's very unfair. And, okay. and so there are systems that are put in place. I mean, this is the name of the game. You are in a culture that you're treated less than, and, and you have barriers and various things systematically that are designed to hold you back. Yeah. And so our goal is to focus on the solution, to focus on, I'm going to get through this, having that mindset of being a no matter what person. Yeah. No matter what you put in front of me, I'm going to find a way to get through this. That's, that's the name of the game. Yeah. That's the opportunity. It's, 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 it's something that if we focus on that, we focus on finding the solutions, then other things come out of that. People say opportunity knocks on every door. I don't believe that. I believe that opportunity stands by silently waiting for you to recognize it. And so I'll never forget I was this, this news host was interviewing me and said, I see the majority of your clients are white. Shouldn't you be talking to black people given their condition? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, black people aren't the ones that's putting systems together to hold people back like Whoa. me. I said, when you feel inferior to someone, mm. you do everything you can not to have to compete with them. <laughs> I said, people who look like you need what I got. <laughs> <laughs> he turned red as a cherry in a glass of milk. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't expect that. I said, come on, man. <laughs> when you know who you are, you welcome competition. You say, bring it on. Yeah. So it's yeah. It, it, everybody, I believe, they have their own stuff that they have to deal with. All of us do. And so we have to constantly realize that life is a fight for territory. And once you stop fighting for what you want, what you don't want will automatically take over with all the stuff that's going on right now. It's been an unspoken conversation, but mm -hmm. then in the last four years, they've been emboldened, the people of darkness saying, we can come out now, yeah, <laughs> it's safe. Yeah, yeah. And so, it, but that, that calls for and demands yeah. that we step up. Yeah. I'm reminded of uh, you getting your first DJ job. With, yes. Uh, banging on the door, Mr. Butterball there, and says, I'm ready, I'm ready. He says, uh, we're, not, we're not hiring, we're not hiring. But not only did you eventually get hired, but when it's time for you to step in as a DJ, you already had your, your intro Already prepared and ready yes, to roll. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I teach that it's better to be prepared for an opportunity and not have one than to have an opportunity and not be prepared. Hmm. But not only was I ready to do that show, when I started working, I became the host of the radio show. I became the music director, the production person, making the commercials, selling commercials. I believe that wherever you go, you want to develop at least a minimum of four to five competencies. You want to, to make yourself invaluable to that corporation, that business that you're working in. This is a time that you have to expand or you are expendable. That the, if you go work for any major corporation right now, they require that you know at least five different positions so if someone does not come in, you can step in there and take over for them. You're talking about the, the last, especially the two years that we've been through, four years. I want to talk about this, especially the two years, because you know, a lot of people have been hurt uh, from lockdowns and mandates and whatever case may, may have been through these last couple of years. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, deemed uh, essential, non-essential, you know, restaurants closing because they literally just can't sell food because people aren't coming in. 
But you talk about people also, hey, I can get a government check, I can get an unemployment check, I can have some subsidies and some, some help. And I see that it's, it's a, a, when we're out there and we're in, interviewing and, and, and talking to a lot of people, they want to find more, more dependency versus independency. Uh, can, can you speak to that in terms of, of playing uh, the, offense that, in this That time? has been the, the liability of the kind of educational system that we have where you measure people's intelligence, not based upon their ability to think, but their ability to memorize. Hmm. So when they put this together, formulated by corporations training people to get jobs, the journey of the broke, they didn't envision a Google. Kids can get information available at their fingertips. <laughs> The encyclopedias. You hear people talk about encyclopedias. <laughs> they go on. <laughs> they go on over here. And so it's it's a it's a different day. And so now in this era, what the late Peter Drucker calls the era of the three C's: accelerated change, overwhelming complexity, and tremendous competition. We have to work to stay ahead of technology. And but there are certain areas that we're in that I think that is protected because of the fact we have a heart. No matter what a computer says to you, they've done studies yeah. with computers talking to people and a human being, we can tell the difference. And the reason we can tell the difference, when you speak from your heart, where your heart is there, your treasure is also. Who you are behind the words that you speak are much louder than the words that people actually hear. And so in the embodiment of those words that you speak, there's an energy, there's a passion, uh, there are experiences that you've gone through, there are stories that people don't just hear with their ears, but they hear in their heart that you're able to connect. Computers don't have a heart. And so... Right now, when we look at where people are, whose lives have been disrupted, mm -hmm. well, disruptions calls for transformation to accommodate it. And so as long as we are continuing to expand our minds, living out of our imagination rather than our history, and, and putting ourselves in communities of collaborative, achievement-driven, supportive relationships, because you can't make it by yourself, iron sharpening iron yep. and upgrading our skill set because that as we look at ourselves we're going to we're going to do what Shula called peak to peak P-E-A-K to P-E-E-K wow you peak to peak how much further can I go so you're always pushing yourself you're always challenging yourself in pursuit of that person that you know that's in you, the next greatest version of yourself, but you haven't quite got there yet. Because yeah, you're, you're the living embodiment. I mean, you're literally a living legend who's destroyed a lot of reasons why you shouldn't succeed, why you shouldn't get ahead. You know, there, mm. there's people out there right now, like, what, what am I supposed to do? They feel helpless. They feel isolated. They feel But they powerless. don't feel that in a vacuum. See, we, we were born to succeed. You're made in the likeness and image of God. It doesn't get any better than that. Yes, right. We were born to succeed. We begin with authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth. But we've been programmed to fail. And so I say, particularly when I'm in church, even though we are made in the likeness and image of God, and been given authority and dominion over everything on the face of the earth. We will never exercise authority and dominion over our lives until we exercise authority and dominion over what we are not. Hmm. <laughs> that we have bought into an image that has been sold to us Dr. Carter G. Woodson said it best. He said, if you can determine what a man shall think, you never have to concern yourself with what he will do. He said, if you can make a man feel inferior, you never have to compel him to seek an inferior status, for he will seek it himself. And if you can make a man feel justly an outcast, you never have to order him to go to the back door. He'll go without being told. And if there's no door, 
his very nature will demand one. <laughs> so our goal and objective in helping people to begin to plug into this economy is to deal with the pandemic that we presently have, but also the virus of mediocrity, HIV, oh. hood-infected virus, AIDS, <laughs> addiction to incarceration, and death syndrome. Powerful stuff. I, well, when, when, Les, when, you're, when you're thinking about the, the wealth gap in America, the income inequality, I, you've never been a person to say, well, who's going to hire me at this? You've always created your own economy. You've yes. made money with a Republican president. You've made mm -hmm. money with a Democratic president. Can you speak to how the person watching this video in this era, in this generation, can start closing this wealth gap instead of worrying about what's going on the, on the outside? How can we be more specific what goes on on the inside? There is, it, it never changes. That's timeless, that all philosophers agree on. It's about you. Adam, where are you? You know, people have to look at themselves. There was a point in my life, i never forget when I got fired from radio, a friend of mine named Robert Boyd, and he said, Les came to see me. He said, Things aren't going to get better for you until you get better. Things are not going to improve in your life until you improve. Yes, they were wrong for firing you. Yes, you stood up for that couple, that Vietnam veteran that was beaten by the police. They shouldn't have done that to him. And they had the power to fire you. So the question now is, mm. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay here and just be depressed and angry and tell anybody who's willing to listen to you what happened to you? Or are you going to do something different with your life? I just want to drop that question on you. And then he got up and left. And I had to ask myself, what am I going to do with this? And I decided to pay attention to what I often say, opportunity does knock on every door. Opportunity stands by silently waiting for you to recognize it. I believe in angels. Shortly thereafter, the next day, a guy named Horace Perkins, a salesman at the radio station, came by the house and said, look, I got these petitions here. Sign your name right here. I said, what is this for? For you to run for state representative. Wow. I said, man, I don't know anything about politics. <laughs> he said, neither do the people who run. <laughs> he said, come on, man, yeah. sign here, and you'll be on the ballot. Yeah. He said, people love you, yeah. and all you have to do is knock on the door and say, hey, this is Les yeah. Brown. Yeah. Remember me? I teach stand up for what you believe in because you can fall for anything. Mm -hmm. I'm still standing. Yep. He said, I guarantee you, people will come out and vote for you. And they did. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of politics, the uh, you know it seems like America today versus being the United States of America it seems like a very divided states uh, of America. Um, when we're looking at policies that could be changed, we we're looking at things that could be improved. Uh, you know, you've had money, you've had power. You know, what, what are some of the things that the person today? Because mid-year elections are coming here at, in uh, in November, next uh, six months or so. And people just don't think that their vote counts. People think that uh, you know the, there's voter fraud or their vote doesn't really matter because somebody's going to win anyway. What, what would you poke at that to remove any illusion whatsoever that people's involvement or lack of understanding of politics uh, doesn't really matter in today's? We have to continue yeah. to educate people on the reality that you can make a difference. Politics is a part of it, but it's not the absolute that we have to be actively engaged in being current in terms of our knowledge and skills because the whoever's in the White House, it doesn't matter if you don't have the skill set and the mindset to turn adversity to your advantage or to find a way to get your piece of the pie. That's the name of the game. Yeah that there's a big pie out here and everybody want a piece of it, but everybody's not going to get a piece of it because the road to life is straight and narrow and, and few there be that find it because few there be 
that are willing to do the inner work. Few there be that are willing to upgrade their skills and their knowledge. Few there be that will face rejections and no's day in and day out and decide it's not over until I win. That most people, they allow themselves to be broken. They will surrender. But you have got to have the kind of mindset. No matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. You're not going to stop me. I have a goal. I have a dream. And my stopping or giving up because of the failures, because of the, the rejections, that's a non-negotiable hmm. no. I'm coming at you from another angle, and I'm not going to stop till I get through. We all have that in us. We don't know how strong we are until we have to be strong. Yeah. And so we are not taught in school resiliency. We're not taught how to handle rejection. That's why so many kids are committing suicide, being bullied, because they have a limited, weak sense of self. Dr. Um, Martin Silliman, who wrote the, the book of, called Psycho-Cybernetics, who discovered mm -hmm. self-image, that we need to have a curriculum that builds a person's sense of identity. Once your life has a sense of identity, that gives your life a sense of purpose. And once your life has a sense of purpose, that gives your life a sense of direction. And so Nietzsche said, if you know the why for living, you can endure almost anyhow. When you know why you're here and what you're supposed to do with your life because of that time that you've taken, to ask yourself some questions of why am I here? What's the meaning of my life? Mark Twain said, the two most important days in your life, the day that you're born and the day that you realize why you're born. Most of us don't take the time to get quiet and get still. Most people die at age 25 and don't get buried until they're 65. Most people don't put their minds around the reality that life is God's gift to us and how we live our lives is our gift to God. Amen to that. Let's demystify a little bit about church and money. Mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes people say, well, you know, Matt, your, your YouTube channel or you guys talk about uh, being faith-based, but it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And, or God would just want you content. God just wants you... And, and yet people are not paying the bills. Yet people aren't tithing. People aren't giving offering. They're not building the kingdom, at least from a financial standpoint. They're not expanding it. We all know that ministries need finances. So can you speak to that in, in terms of help? Maybe that's a myth. Maybe that's a myth. If we, if we look at the difference between what I do and what ministers do, ministers preach the gospel about Jesus. I preach the gospel that Jesus preached. <laughs> they sell the messenger I sell his message boom when they demanded of the Jewish carpenter when the kingdom of God shall come he said he didn't talk about brick and mortar some building the kingdom of God cometh not by observation they shall say it's neither low there low here behold the kingdom of God is within you You can't have a kingdom without a king. Kings rule. You must master the king in you. Most of us have been programmed to fail. Most of us are being manipulated by the media, by computers. Studies indicate that most people look at their phone over 400 times a day. They've given up control, the real estate of their mind, the kingdom within, to commercial advertising. They've been programmed to be fans, to be spectators, as opposed to being co-creators and how they're going to live their lives. You know, Abraham Lincoln said, the future belonged to those who created. We were born to create. And so this time where we are 
this place where we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People should not be focused on the television set and what's going on in the Ukraine, and my heart goes out to them and my prayers and my support for them. But they should be focused on what kind of person must I become that will help me to learn how to turn adversity to my advantage. Because life is going to always be challenging. Mm -hmm. Think it not strange that you're faced to fiery furnaces of this world. You will, not you might, you will have tribulations. It's a part of the process. And so our goal is, is to master your kingdom. That, that we have to go within, as we say, that you don't live life as it is. You live life as you are. And so when, if we train our children how to live their lives from the inside out as opposed to the outside in, we can reduce the dropout rate, the suicide rate, the unexplained violent behavior, people mm. fighting over toilet paper yeah. in a grocery store or fighting over a parking spot. That's somebody that's not in their right mind. And so people are breaking down to a very large extent. But the people that will make it through this place where we are, there's an African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. And Shakespeare said, the fort dear Brutus is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. If, if people take the time, a minimum of two to three times a day, to get still, to get quiet, to go within. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth thee, and listen to the whispering of your soul. What am I supposed to do next? As opposed to listening to the world. Yeah. What you tune into, you turn into. So in this space, we have to focus on how to begin to elevate ourselves above the culture above all the stuff that we see and focus on the whole vision of what we want to manifest. My favorite book says, I'll give you all your eyes can see. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with me. You might run over here, but you'll limp back. Don't mess with me. <laughs> One thing I've always recognized about your, your skill, your talent, um, is that you're just the impeccable with telling stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm envisioning a 20, 30 year old Les Brown starting a speaking career. What do you do when you were taking notes from, because every time I've, I've done speaking, I'm like, I wish I would have said that. I wish I would have said this. And I'm, I'm picturing maybe you, you're doing that too as well to improve the next time you speak and deliver yes. the message. So what do you do? What did you do? Would you do continually to improve your skill set to deliver your message better as a speaker? To me, the best speakers are the best listeners. Watching and observing people, and most importantly, observing yourself. Because most of us go through life on automatic, based upon the programming, the things that's in our minds, that's governing our behavior that we are unaware of. Okay. The great anthropologist, Margaret Mead, she was in a restaurant in London and, and a waiter noticed her and he said, you know, there's several Americans here tonight. And she asked, is that right? He said, yeah. She said, I tell you what, I want to do something. And he said, what is it? She said, let me know when you serve them dessert. I can tell you exactly how many Americans here. He said, you can't. She said, let me know. And so he came over later. He said, okay, mm -hmm. I've served dessert. She got up, she walked around, she looked, observed people eating their dessert. She counted them. She said, there are 35 Americans here. He checked the roster. He said, how did you know? She said, in the UK, when you eat a dessert, a piece of pie or cake, you eat it from the crust toward the tip in America. We eat it from the tip, tip toward the crust. What else have we picked up? There are things that we learn through observation, through our environment, and through the things that we experience. And so when 
we have things as governing our behavior that we picked up between zero and six, according to Martin Seligman, who wrote the book Learned Optimism. We've learned how to be helpless. And the things that we experience between zero and six, there's a word that's in our heart that's either yes or no. And those decisions, that vision of yourself, the people that impacted you, those behaviors will follow you for the rest of your life unless there's an interruption. And that's what we bring, the interruption. For them to step out of their mental conditioning and, and to begin to cultivate a sense of greatness, self-awareness, self-approval, mm -hmm. and continuing to raise that level of what we expect from ourselves, what we want from life, and self-commitment, and the willingness to put in the work, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established, and all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. So I don't know how to do it. Not a problem. Lean not unto thine own understanding. No, you don't have to know. Just do what you can do. And God will do what you can't do. <laughs> just, just give it a shot. Bet on you. Yeah. Take a chance on you. Superman is not coming. I told them not to eliminate those telephone booths. <laughs> because right. he'll get arrested for indecent exposure. exposure. Yes, and he'd go in the, have to go in a closet somewhere. <laughs> no, they, yeah. they eliminated the telephone booths anyhow. Now nah, he ain't coming. Yeah, <laughs> no, he ain't coming now. Nah, no, he ain't gonna try to cover himself with a telephone book. There ain't no more telephone books. So I'm just saying. <laughs> My medication. I'm just, I'm just that picture right yeah, there. Right. My, um, med my medication went all right by now. I, would, I want to shift gears to to you know, financial literacy and financial education, just the importance of it. And, and you know, you know, coming from a background, you know, there's 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 uh, four things that we talk about all the time at, at our company, which is these steps. And I want to get your input on okay. it. Okay. Um, number one, why is it important for somebody, no matter what they do, why they have to learn sales? Because life is about selling. You, nothing happens until something is sold. It's a skill set that allows you to be in control of your personal economy. The ability to present yourself, to make a point, to sell an idea, to influence, to motivate and inspire people. To sell, first of all, yourself on I can do this. That's the first sale. I do a training called Focus on the Seller. First, you have to sell yourself that I can make this happen. People are listening and they want to experience a level of assurance that you believe what you're telling me. Once I feel that, because our goal is not just to speak to be heard, but to speak to be felt. And when you believe something, people can feel it. They can sense it. They can smell residual breath. <laughs> okay, they can smell it, you know. But as my Angelo said, people don't care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. So when you believe in what you're doing, you care about the people that you're talking to. We're talking at a time where suicide rate is up, the divorce rate up by 40%. People who have lost their businesses, suffering from empty pockets, broken hearts, um, cringing that the end of the month does not come real soon because they don't have enough money to go around. Mm -hmm. And so this is a time that people need to be able to affirm to themselves, no matter how bad it is or how bad it gets, I'm going to make it. The stuff that we experience, uh, one of the quotes I love is that in life you will always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities, brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. So if we look at what's going on in our lives as a God-ordained opportunity, 
brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges, we focus on finding the good. Every day is not going to be a good day, but there's some good in every, every day. day. <laughs> But I'm just, I'm just thinking about myself. I'm doing a little bit of self-reflection just listening to you. I'm just thinking about me on stage and things I'm telling my team. I can't believe how much a lot of your tapes and CDs have already embedded in, my, them, in myself. And by the way, I'm not taking any credit for it. It's just coming from the source right here. <laughs> and how much of the catchphrase I'm seeing you said, I'm like, I haven't read. How many times has he said something I've said in... in Easy. I'm like, wow, yeah. I'm like, that's yeah. where it came from. Yeah. Well, one, well, one of the things is that we have to train people who want to present and connect people how to deliver info bites. Okay, an info bite to me is interesting. Live your life the way that you want to leave your life. Ladies and gentlemen, as I speak to you right now, if you had 90 days to live, how many of you will make some radical changes in your life? And most people raise their hands. And then you take a poll. You know what the majority of them will say? I will quit my job. Hmm. Why? Because that's not them. Yeah. They're not doing something that's them. You spend 40 to 60 hours a week doing something that's not you. Yeah. That's stressful. But if you're doing something that's you, that's your passion. And so when you realize that we have a choice to accept life as it is yep. or be an active force for good to decide, I don't want to just survive. This is not me. Yep. What it takes to survive and what it takes to live, those are two totally different things. Yeah. And you gotta be willing to work for that. A lot of people are afraid of that four letter word. Willingness, mm -hmm. W, the willingness to do the things today others won't do in order to have the things tomorrow others won't have. O, ownership of your life, taking full responsibility for where you are. George Bernard Shaw said that, that people that make this life, they look around for the circumstances they want and if they can't find them, they create them. The R stands for willingness to reinvent yourself. To that, that in order for a man to gain his life, he must lose his life. So you've got to be willing to die to who you are now, to give birth to who you are to become. And the K stands for kindred spirits. You've got to come out from among people who don't have goals, who don't have dreams. People rub off on you. You earn within two to three thousand dollars of your closest friends. Academy Award winner Sidney Poitier said, when you go for a walk with someone, something happens without being spoken. Either you adjust to their pace or they adjust to your pace. Whose pace have you adjusted to? Wow. And so if people are willing to do the work, whosoever will, let him come. A person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. Boom! Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I want to ask you this question now because we teach financial concepts, we teach financial literacy. It's been kind of weird the last couple of years because a lot of people have been just plugging in via Zoom or online. But what has been the power of assembling together, coming together? Because we do weekly meetings, we do conferences. It is so important because we're living in a time, we've gone from brick and mortar to click and order. So the communicators, the storyteller, Steve Jobs said, the storyteller is the most powerful person in the world because storytellers can set the agenda for the culture, can influence and impact people. So, the, so we, 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 when you're dealing with a group of people who don't know and think they know, who've been programmed to be spectators and fans, talking about who's the GOAT, who's the greatest of all time, Kobe or mm, Michael Jordan. Jordan, and can't afford a ticket to a game, to your own life. Hello. Who's the goat in your life, the greatest of all time? 
What is it that has to happen for us to see the next greatest version of who you were chosen to be? You were chosen out of 400 million sperm. God had a lot of choices and he chose you. Don't make him regret it and say, why in the hell did I do that? <laughs> so that's previous to coming to our current business model where we're at today. I spent eight years in the Marines and then I spent 11, 12 years as just an individual uh, insurance salesman, personal producer. I was selling life insurance, annuities, retirement plan, whatnot. But I was, I was limited. I was stuck. I could recruit people and, and, and bring people into my fold because they were attracted to the money I was making. But I eventually end up losing people because of lack of retention due to systems and compensation models. But the model that we have right now is a system where we can build teams, we can build agencies across the country, coast to coast. And when it comes to a, a mindset of just me, myself, and I versus actually building teams, building other people, right? What, what guidance and advice will you give for somebody who said, you know, I'm so used to just being myself versus actually leading a team of different personalities, different human beings, and different uh, upbringing, socioeconomic differences. What would, what would be your, your thoughts on that transition? You know why I'm meeting with you? Why is that less? Because of you. Ed called me, 95% of all organizations who build strong, sustainable, competitive groups and do market takeaways have strong leadership. Dexter used to say the speed of the leader the speed of the group. So when Ed called me, not one time did he mention the compensation plan. He talked to me about you, about your character, about what you value, about what he saw in you. And he sounded like the woman at the well. Wow. <laughs> you know, I used to do that sermon, said he asked, uh, the, I used to do the sermon, and the sermon was, she, she said, he asked me for some, I didn't give him none, and then he went and told it all over town. <laughs> he asked her for water, <laughs> and she didn't give him no water, and then she went and told it all over town. But these dirty-minded people came to hear something else. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get back to you. So I didn't know what the product was. Yeah, he did mention insurance. I said, okay. But he had my attention talking about you. And I said, I want to meet him. And that's why I said, get him on the phone. Don't think that people leave as you have expressed because of the compensation plan. Will you lose some people? Yes. Amway has one of the worst compensation plans in the world. Limited compensation. People did not leave because of the relationship. The relationship. And so you have a relationship with a friend of mine that I respect, who respects you, and said, you need to meet him. And I said, okay, I'm in. And so you be who you are. You are the money. People buy into you. And things are going to change in your business. Mm -hmm. Quincy Jones is right. Everything was changed. Nothing stays the same. When things are good, it has not come to stay, it has come to pass. When things are bad, it has not come to stay, it has come to pass. This thing called life, it's a roller coaster. Yeah. Some things, sometimes things go well, sometimes they don't go so well. What is the sustaining competitive advantage that you will have other over, com over companies that come into your space? Trust. Character. T.D. Jakes has a quote, Lord, don't let my talents take me where my character can't keep me. So people who believe in you will stick with you through thick, high water, and hell because of you. That's how it's built, the relationship.
That's, that's the, the, the new currency in this space True. because people want to know, can I trust you? Can I believe in you? Yep. You know, are you for real? Yep. And so your being who you are and how you serve people and how you're showing up, that, that's powerful leadership built upon integrity and walking your walk. That's last question. Thank you so much. And uh, much love to Ed Blunt and family. Mm -hmm. My last question is throughout this process, throughout this journey, and breaking the patterns as I'm hearing that repeat some form or fashion throughout this conversation, somebody's basically got to change. Somebody has to evolve. Somebody has to grow. And sometimes people have been thinking that they are who they thought they were until somebody from the outside says, <laughs> no, you're not. And that for a lot of people, they're, you know, they're disrupted by it because whether the ego gets hit or their pride gets hit or they were this person in corporate America for a minute and they get let go, they get resized, reshuffled, and they're not who they thought they were. And now what we're discovering coming into this era that we're running into a lot of people that would never have considered entrepreneurship, that would have never considered getting involved in the financial services industry, can you speak to somebody in that transition and move to doing something that they've never thought before because 90% of the people that we are in, we're getting licensed have zero financial service experience in the past, which is a very healthy thing for our industry. Remember when I said, in order to make it, mental resolve, a thirst and a willingness to learn, and collaborative achievement-driven supportive relationships. If you're willing to learn, no one can stop you. If you're not willing to learn, no one can help you. People who are not willing to learn how to earn money in this space don't get good sleep at night and they have skinny children. And on Monday morning, they're afraid to go to the toilet because Monday morning, the heart attack rate increases by 35% people getting ready to go to jobs that's not them, and the majority of them die on the toilet. Wow. The wow is right. <laughs> it's something else. <laughs> yeah. You found in the toilet, just done, yes, checked out. absolutely, going to do something that's not you. Yes. So this space where we are, this is the only game in town and computers are not going anywhere and what computers can do and we have them in our business that once we get them in the funnel and many times we don't have to have human participation mm -hmm. the computer does the rest yeah. all right but when you have something that you have to establish confidence yep. and trust and leadership. Yep. People are addicted to listening to personalities and responding to people who can speak to where they are, who've gone through what they have gone through. Your experience as a Marine, well, one instantly talk about and think about toughness and discipline and loyalty. And so that, that, that level of patriotism, that willingness to serve the country, to make the world a better place so we can get a good night's sleep, so that we don't go to sleep hearing bombs and, mm -hmm. and, and worrying about ISIS, uh, that that kind of leadership, you just automatically you want you have a sense of can I feel safe with him? That I feel safe with you. And and you're going to attract people like you. Birds of the feather flock together. That's real. Yep. In a positive sense and a negative mm -hmm. sense. So you are it. And I when I think about Dexter as I look at you. Dexter had organizations in 26 different countries. 
He made a million dollars every 17 hours. <laughs> he used to drive two and three hundred miles to do a one-on-one -on -one close with someone, with his wife, to talk to another couple. If you're going to be in his organization, you should know the color of the rug in the living room of the person that you have recruited because you've sent, been there and done presentations. You should know their anniversaries yeah. because you're building a long-term relationship. Relationship is the true capital. Things are going to happen in the systems. It's a part of it. But as long as you are the constant, they'll stay with you. They'll trust the person that moved them to a place within themselves where they could not go by themselves and say, I can do this. I feel safe. And I'm going to stay the course. Two bonus questions. Okay, two bonus questions. <laughs> so this first question goes to uh, Mr. Les Brown, and then we're going to throw it to Mr. Matt Zappala. Mr. Brown, you, you've had to overcome so many different challenges in your life as a, a father, a husband, uh, someone who's gone through divorce, someone who's lost their job, someone who's faced so many obstacles, and you could have easily given in to excuses. You could have easily bought into all of the self-imposed limiting talk that so many people find themselves up against. Where did you get the will to? I hear you talk about willingness. Where did you get the will to, to continue to overcome, stay focused on your dreams and your goals and to make things happen for those that are listening that are in that place right now? I'm so glad you asked that question. One of my favorite books is Man's Search for Meaning. Victor Franco. And he said he was in the Nazi German concentration camps. He said the Jews that survived the inexpressible cruelties of Nazism had some power greater than themselves that they believed in, or some movement that they bought into, or some family member that they were determined to see again. And what it boiled down to, he said, if you know the why for living, you can endure almost anyhow. If you've got a reason that drives you. My reason was I had made a commitment. I was going to buy my mother a home. And nothing was going to turn me around. I was going to make that happen. That was not some wish. My brothers and sisters, they didn't share it. They thought I was crazy. But that became my reason for being. I faced a lot of rejections. And I just saw it as a part of the process, that you have to roll with the punches. Because I was in this place where Paul Robinson, who said, here I stand, for I can do no other. And I was determined that I was going to find a way through speaking to earn enough money that I'd be available to my mother to take care of her, who was suffering from breast cancer. I promised her when... I was a kid, I said, you'll never go into a nursing home. She used to work in nursing homes. And she always said she never wanted to go into a nursing home. I said, I promise you, that will not be your destiny. And when my sister called me and said, Leslie, are you sitting down? I asked, what's wrong with Mama? I just got reelected to the higher legislature. And they had, appointed me to the chairmanship of the Education Committee and the Human Resource Committee. And she said, Mama has breast cancer. I say, I'll be there tomorrow. She said, but you just got elected. I said, listen to me. I enjoy politics. 
but I love mama and I promised her I'll be there. And she said, Leslie, they have a lot of good nursing homes in Dade County. I say, please don't touch her. I'll be there tomorrow. I caught a plane the next morning and I'll never forget ringing the doorbell. And a friend of hers, the name is Mildred, was there. And she came to the door and she said, oh my God, Mamie, Leslie's here. And I could hear my mother say, I knew he would come. Hmm. I knew he would come. Mildred unpacked those box, boxes. He's here. I knew he would come. You have to have something that drives you. When others give up and surrender and throw in the towel, something get, can cause you to reach a place within yourself where you say, I don't feel nowhere is tied. I'm going to get it done. That makes you unstoppable. I was there. I took care of her until she left here, bought her home. Got to find something that pulls you into the future. There's a stand that you decide to take with your life. And Matt's a power like Mr. Brown. You, you went through some challenges. You've been very transparent talking about being a husband, a father, and then a single father within a very short period of time. And many people that are dealing with children will often use the children as an excuse as to why they can't get things done and do the work that's required to provide. So you coming from the, the military, not having any experience with generating significant life-changing income, where did you get the will to to say, yes, I'm going to get this done, even though I have kids that I'm responsible for as a single parent, I gotta figure it out. Where's that will to come from? Came from my parents. Came from my parents immigrating here from the Philippines and uh, just hearing stories about what it took for my mother to get her first job as a nurse at a hospital. 600 bucks a month as a nurse. <laughs> And then my father coming here because he was a tour guide in the Philippines and he just basically sold himself on a free airplane ride in America and, <laughs> and get himself into Indiana University. And I, I thought to myself that every generation has this great decision. And I felt my decision said, you know what? I've got this gift of entrepreneurship. We got this gift of an insurance license. I have no college degree. I have no other alternatives. And I get these three miles looking at me and they're looking for me to come home and provide a home and, and activities and cheerleading and martial arts and all that football and all this stuff that any other kid would want to enjoy. But I know I couldn't depend on anybody else because as a single father, I had to do all that. I had to put myself in a position where I had no other options but to. Because what was my alternative? My alternative was to have the other uh, uh, party in the life and not have control or the access that I'm able to provide myself having to divvy up decisions. And as a single parent, you have to make those decisions twice, three times as hard because there is no other financial assistance from the other side. I, mean, I was one of those weird single fathers where I actually had custody of my kids. And if I'm looking at them and they're expecting uh, everything from me and they didn't expect to be here, my, my decision with them was, listen, you don't owe me anything. I owe you everything, at least at the very extent of showing you an example of what to do during tough times and showing you and giving you a work ethic. And so when, when I'm looking at this and I decide to put a flat flag in the ground, I want to be able to say, I want to, my kids to say, you know what? I may not agree with everything that daddy did, but man, I respect him. I respect his hustle. I respect the grind. And I found that the older they've become, the smarter I've become to them. <laughs> and so we may not have uh, times when they were teenagers or in their early te or late teens and early 20s, but now as it's starting to get older, now they're starting to understand the perspective of where I came from. So that was the future self I was talking about. What, the, what would these kids say? They may not have agreed with me, but man, my dad is somebody I want to follow. His footsteps may not be necessarily, or his career may not be the career, but man, I want to follow the way he went about business, the way he went about 
uh, making decisions in his life and I want to be able to them to say, my daddy gave me a great last name. Now it's up for me not to screw it up. Well, if you've been watching this, I'd love to know your thoughts, your questions, your comments. What would you say? Put it in the comment section below. If you haven't done so, make sure you're following Mr. Les Brown here on all social media platforms. And uh, we're just talking about a course that uh, he has here too. So I'm very intrigued about this conversation and where it's going to evolve to. And for those of you that's watching this, if you're looking for a conversation about how to learn the rules of the money game, if you're looking for a conversation how to understand sales and entrepreneurship and be in an environment to help foster you growing into the next evolution, the next best version of yourself, please drop your thoughts and questions in the comment section below. We'll make sure we get back to you too as well. So with that being said, Mr. Les Brown, I'm so honored to be here. It's a plum pleasing pleasure. Pleasure as and well as a, a privilege. privilege. <laughs> to meet you, sir. <laughs> Rock and roll. If yeah. you said, guys, appreciate you. If you're watching that on YouTube, make sure you click like, hit subscribe, hit notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. From Mr. Les Brown's boardroom here, we appreciate you. Until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.